Great, thank you. Um, so I, I'm one of the co-creators of the Julia programming language. I am not really going to be talking about Julia, but I'm going to be talking about a problem that I have wrestled with personally in Julia. Um, we have a pretty good implementation of this, but it's one of these problems that seems totally innocuous, and you're like, "What's? why is this an issue? And it just turns out to be this very, very deep rat hole that I maybe have gotten to the end of, but we'll see. All right, so floating point ranges. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is a little bit of noodling in the terminal. Uh, so here we go. All right. Uh, so there's a syntax for floating point ranges. Some of you may be familiar with it. You can write, you know, this, the colons. Uh, so that what this means is that you start at 0 0.1 and you step by 0 0.2 and you want to stop at 1.9. Um, and in Julia, we represent this as an object, so it prints back in the same syntax you started in, but you know, if you want to collect it into a vector, you can do that. And you see, you get, you get what you would expect. It's nothing, nothing too nuts. Um, but sort of, you know, imagine we were trying to implement this like naively. Um, how would we generate these values, given that we started, we started with, uh, you know, the starting point equals 0.1 and the step, sorry, I'm gonna call, sorry, I'm gonna call this starting point A and the step uh, 0 0.2 and the end point 1.9. Okay, so the most obvious thing is you write A plus uh, I times step for I equals, uh, well, zero, and then I happen to know this is not, this was length nine but you know, I would actually compute that from like B minus A over S. Actually, I mean, why not, why not write that? Round int B minus A over S. Okay, ah, okay, well, so that's not so nice. We have all these like floating point errors and people may recognize one of the most famous ones. Why is you know, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 not equal to 0 0.3? And okay, well, indeed, why? is that happening? Um, so Julia is a great language for exploring these things because we have all these like numerical tools. So I can just turn this into a big float uh, and see that the actual value of the floating point number 0 0.1 is not, it's not 1 tenth. It's got all this, these extra digits after the 16th or 17th decimal point. Similar for 0 0.2, uh, it's a little bit bigger than, than true 1 tenth. And then 0 0.3, it's a little bit smaller so here's the problem. This is the crux. 0 0.1 is a little bit bigger than 1 tenth. 0 0.2 is a little bit bigger than 2 tenths. And then 0 0.3 is a little bit smaller than 3 tenths. So you can't add two things that are a little bit too big and get something that's a little too small. So what you end up with is you get this value that is, you know, it's the next representable float after 0 0.3. All right. So, you know, let's, let's, can we try some other things? So let's say we tried... Uh, we tried this, okay, that was naive. Maybe, um, maybe linear interpolation will work better. We'll do, uh, we'll do nine, I'm just gonna do nine because I know that it's nine. Nine minus a over nine times, so this is basically, this is gonna start at zero and then go all the way up to one. And then for the other one, we're gonna do one over nine times s for, you know, for the, this range. Uh, whoop, I got some number wrong here. Do I need tens? I might need tens. Uh, no, everything should be right. Let me look at, I wrote this example down so I can get it right. We'll see. Uh, oh, uh, sorry. The reason it's not working is because you, for linear interpolation, you need the start and end points. Um, okay, so nine minus six. Let me make sure, oh, sorry, now I still have that 10 in there. I was right the first time, then I edited it. And, okay, so now we have, we see that this is, this is wrong in just a different way. So, you know, this is what we had before. This is what we have now, still not actually better. Uh, maybe if we reorder the operations a little bit, we can do better. Sometimes, you know, waiting to divide later is helpful. 
Um, so instead of doing the divisions by nine first, I'm going to do them. Okay, this is yet another way to do this wrong. Um, okay, so what I'm showing here is just like the naive things you would try just don't, none of them work. Um, you have to do something much cleverer. Um, of course, the, the straightforward thing to do here is to say, you know, I'm going to do, um, you know, I'm going to do uh, divide, by, divide by 10 at the end. So basically, you know, you want, you want 0 0.1 through 1.9, so you want to do, uh, ah. you want to do I, you know, one, my typing skills are severely lacking today for I, Okay, that gives me 10 times the thing, and then I, I want to, at the end, divide by 10. Okay, of course, that gives me exactly the right values. So, but how did you get that? Like, I knew that because I looked at the thing, and I was like, oh, well, obviously, you're trying to do, you know, from 1 tenth up to 1.9 in steps of 2, two tenths. Um, so we have to somehow suss out the intent of the user here. And I'll show you why this is a little bit of a hard problem in the talk. OK, so this is the worst guessing game ever. This is basically the problem. So contrary to common myth, floats are exact. They exact, represent an exact you know, value, but they can only represent some rational values, specifically the ones that have a power of two denominator. So they're all of this form, n over 2 to the p, and that's it. It seems very limited, but you know, given a high enough power of two and a large enough number value n, you can, you know, you can get pretty close to whatever you want. Um, so when we get a range a colon s colon b uh, and their floats, it's already too late. Like the floats have already lost the in in information about the intent of the user. Um, and they, they might not have written them as literal. We might have got done a computation. They might have written one divided by 10 or it might have come from somewhere else. So in, to generally solve this, we can't really, you know, we can't, we have to be able to just like take the floats and figure out something that makes sense. Um, so we have one fact to go on here, basically. We know that the user, user wanted actual numbers that had a plus n times s equals b, right? So the length where, the length of the range is actually n plus one, but we have this number n. We know that when we multiply the, the, the beginning, if we add this, you know, the step to the beginning point n times, we should get to the end point. Otherwise, they don't, they don't match. So we need to use that fact to maximum advantage. All right, so for a given floating point number x, there's an interval of real numbers that it actually could, that round to it. Um, there's a subtlety here, because we say x represents a certain, you know, rational exactly, but we also simultaneously recognize, oh yeah, there's a bunch of numbers we could have meant that would round to this, and so you know, which one did we actually want? So we'll put x in brackets to represent the interval of those, the, the you know, real numbers. So x is a float; it's represented in memory. The the interval of real numbers, we you know, we're not representing it in the in the in the computer because we can't really, but we can think about it and make proofs about it. So we meant if someone gives us x, we know they meant you know, and I'm going to use italic x for the real numbers. There was some real number in that interval that they actually intended. Um, and so when we have this you know, range a colon s colon b, we really want to guess true value, true real values that were intended. Okay. And for those true real values, this holds exactly this equation. So that's kind of, that's kind of where we're going to go with this. So we, we currently have a pretty good implementation of this in Julia, but it's a really gnarly hack. Um, but it's also probably better than any other system. So and there was some there were some people who you know were unhappy about when I put it in um, because they were like it's not sufficiently principled we should just do something naive but you've seen the naive versions give you get a lot of issues if you do the naive thing because everyone complains like why does why is your math broken um, so our current approach is you compute n by rounding b minus a over s uh, and then you find the simplest rational number in the interval that for the start point, and then you do the same thing for the end point, and then 
in rational arithmetic, you've got two rational numbers and uh, n, and you check if, if that actually matches. If it, 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 I think the b and a here at the bottom should have been italic, but whatever. Um, and if, the, if it doesn't match, you fall back on some simple thing that is just you know the, the naive thing. Um, so there's some problems with this. One problem is there are cases where the length is ambiguous. Um, so rounding like that should work, but there could be if it's, you know, if this expression b minus a over s is a really big number and it loses precision, there could be a lot of integers that map to it. Um, so rounding gives you one of them, it may not be the right one. So that's a problem. Um, Problem two is picking a rational in A and B in the A and B interval separately. They might not agree, so there might be some rational you could have picked that would like make them hit, you know, make the the equation work out. But you because you picked them independently and then checked, you didn't get the right one. You got a, some other one that doesn't work, and then you just bail out and do the stupid thing. Um, Problem three is that A, S, and B can be either too big or too small to be represented by ratios of integers because the floating point range is very big. Um, so I have an example of that. Uh, let me, it's probably in my history. Yeah, this is, so here's an example. So this is, you know, floating point notation for X, for, this is three times 10 to the 50th, negative three times 10, 10 to the 50th. The step is one, times 10 to the 50th, and the endpoint is four times 10 to the 50th. And this, are, this is currently broken in Julia. So you see the endpoint ends up being too big by like a little bit. Um, and if you, if you collect, collect the actual interval, so it's doing the naive thing, which is broken. If you collect it, you see these are not the nice steps they should be. Um, and in particular, if you look at this middle one, that's supposed to be zero. <laughs> It is very much not zero. It is like, you know, four times 10 to the 34th. That's way off. Um, it's pretty good relative, but uh, you know, it's still, it's still way off. We would like it to be actually zero. Uh, so can we do better? So I've, I've, I've actually been mulling on this for a while. I have like an implementation of something and then this week working on this, I think I have an even better version of it, which is what I'm gonna describe. Um, so observation, the hardest thing to make the range hit is zero. So if it's supposed to hit zero, it's hard to make it hit zero because, uh, basically because you know, the, there's a lot of, they're very fine grained representations of the floats around there. So if you're off by you know, even, I think the smallest representable float is five times 10 to the negative 324. So that's like a tiny, tiny value. So if you're off at all, you miss zero. Um, but we often have that the step divides the start and the stop. So we should be hitting zero exactly when that happens. Because if you think about it, like you've got a start and a stop, and if they're on opposite sides of zero, then there's a step, and you're basically just, you know, you have, you have this grid of values, and zero should be one of them. Um, that's what I'm going to talk about here. So the, each range implies an infinite grid. So if we just ignore the start and end points and just think about, like, there's actually a step and a kind of an offset and then, you know, there's all the things you hit by that, by this like, this arithmetic. Um, and you can either take it, take it from either end, right? A plus an integer times the step, uh, or B minus or plus whatever you want, an integer times the step, because you do all the integers, so it doesn't matter whether it's plus or minus. So basically it's just everything of this form forms a grid. Um, and you know, if the range hits zero, if the extended range hits zero, that's the same thing as zero being in this grid set. Um, and we're gonna, we're, that's gonna be a key point. So in observation two, even when we don't have zero in the grid, we usually have zero in some like finer version of the grid. So basically if we cut our step in half or in thirds or in sevenths, then we would hit zero. Um, so for example, in this, in this example, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, this doesn't hit zero because, in the extended version because 0 0.1 minus 0 0.2 overshoots zero. It steps over it. But if we cut the grid in half, then we do, then zero's in there because basically it's, you know, it, steps, it steps over it, but it's symmetrical around zero. All right, so this is the approach. 
find the smallest d, which is an integer. Uh, it's, it's a positive integer, actually, such that both of these are true. d times the interval a over the interval s. And you have to do some annoying interval arithmetic here to like get the largest and smallest value of that division based on the interval. But it's doable. It's not crazy. Um, and you want that interval to contain some integer. So if, you know, if, if, the, if the range already hits zero, should be hitting zero, then d is just going to be one. We don't have to scale any, at all. Um, if, if it doesn't hit zero exactly, we might have to scale some more. And we want both of them to be able to hit zero, uh, both of the endpoints. All right, and then once we have that case, so the, we have those same intervals, we're going to pick nice integers in them. If there's only one integer in there, that's the integer you pick if you don't have any choice. But there might be more than one integer in there. So for example, in the, the you know, three, three, times, three times 10 to the 50th, um, 50 decimal digits is way more than a float can represent. So you actually have a lot of integers in there to pick from when you're doing this. Um, and this also implicitly, these are integers, and that it, they give you the range length by telling you that n is equal to e minus c. Uh, picking a nice integers is a whole thing. This had me stumped for a bit. Um, so this is the example, three, 3 times 10 to the 50th. That interval of real numbers that map to it contains a lot of integers because um, there just aren't, there aren't enough floating point bits. Um, so we want to pick, but, that, but you know, the actual number 10 times, 3 times 10 to the 50th is the number we want, clearly. Like, that's the thing. If you got this number, this is the thing someone meant. They don't mean one of the other integers that's like nearby there that has like lots of bits. Um, so we need we also need something efficient. We can't sit here and like spend huge amounts of time figuring this out, um, and it has to be generally intuitive. So the thing I came up with is pick a number that is divisible by the largest power of two. Um, in that, so in this interval, you're like which which integer in this interval has the lar is divisible by the largest power of two. Um, basically maximizing the trailing zeros. Uh, and it can be done efficiently with integer operations, which is nice. OK, and it's effective because 2 divides 10. We're lucky that 2, you know, we use, we use base 10. If we used base 7, we would be kind of screwed on this. But I'm sure we'd have other problems, too. Um, so 10, 10 if, you know, if, if a power of 10 divides a number, then a, that same power of 2 divides that number, right? Um, so, for example, we know that 3 times 10 to the 50th has to be divisible by 2 to the 50th. Um, so it tends to pick these numbers that, are, that, we, that we want. Uh, okay, back to the algorithm, the main algorithm. So now we know how to pick in nice integers. Let, let g um, be s, where we, we divide the, 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 the true step by this d that we've figured out. Um, so we don't actually know what s and g are yet. But we're just saying this is what they're what what we're going to denote it as. So now our like our our fine grained grid that definitely hits zero is of the form k times g for just k being all the integers. Um, and now we have from our original you know true values our our true start point is c times g, and our true step is d times g, and our true end point is e times g. OK, and then we can also write this in terms of like they belong to the, the intervals for the, for the input numbers. Um, and so we can actually take an inter we, we, we can divide, move things over, because these are real numbers. Division and multiplication actually work correctly, as opposed to floats where you know, there's rounding involved. Um, so now we've got g on the left-hand side of a bunch of intervals, so we can just intersect them. So we, now we have this like smaller inter interval that we know g has to be in, and we just have to pick a good number in there, and then we've got our grid. Um, how do we pick g? Uh, this, this is where we've kind of reached the end of what I'm not, I'm not sure of. Um, one option is to find the simplest rational in the interval, do the same kind of rational lifting thing that we were doing in the hacky version that is the current Julia implementation. Um, I'm, that might work. Uh, or maybe when we want to minimize the error from the given floating point numbers we got. Uh, I don't know. I have to test a little bit, see what happens. And then, OK, then the question is, once we have g, what do we do with it? Um, well, we compute g times d times uh, 
the, the index that we want into the range and then some you know, offset value Z, whatever. You can just figure out what that is. It's, good. it's easy enough. Um, so this is nice and easy, but there's a problem, which is that we do not have enough precision with one with 64 bits to make this work. We're not gonna get good values. Um, so what you can do, this is a classic numerical computing hack. You split G into G low and G high, where high is the high order bits and G is the low order bits. Um, and you can do that by just, there's, you know, essentially what you're, you're not, it's not like you have G and then you figure this out. What you're actually gonna do is you're gonna write the algorithm in such a way that you, you figure out G high and G low as separate things. Um, and then you can compute this sum. Uh, so it's basically just sp splitting it up. Okay, so let's try it and see if that actually works. Um, all right, so let me see. Actually, let me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna copy some code from my notes so I don't have to type it. Um, okay, so here's our classic, our example that we've been going through. And okay, so we define. Bad syntax there. Okay, so I'm going to define G to be a floating, a, a big float that is, the, it's not exactly one tenth, but it's exact enough. Um, and so we end up with G high being 0.1. That's not surprising. That's what it's supposed to be. But G low is that. And that's basically the correction to the floating point number 0.1 that you need to get closer to the true value one tenth. Um, all right, and so now, the naive thing to do here um, is this. Okay, didn't, didn't want to press enter yet because you want some suspense, but okay. So yeah, so g high times this, int this is, and this thing is nice because it's an integer, right? So you're computing an integer, there's no error. So, and then you multiply it by g high, and then you do the same thing with g low, and you're supposed to get the right answer. Wah, wah, we don't. Okay, so the problem here is you need what's called a fused multiply add. Um, and that's a, it's an instruction all modern machines have, and basically it does this multiply, and then adds this value to it, all in higher order with, with more bits, enough bits to make the, the two operations together exact. And then you get the right answer. So like that's, <laughs> that was, that, this, is, this, is the, this is the like the end point. This is what we were, this very simple thing is what we were trying to get to. Um, and then I've, I wanna do the, the bigger example. Um, so here are the, this is the one that Julia currently gets wrong. Um, but we, we now, if we do this with the fuse multiply add, it should work. Yeah, it does it right. So, all right. So that's, that's it. That's the presentation. <laughs>